This video is made possible by Surfshark VPN. Finally, it's the video you've all been waiting for. What are those four towers? So just how do those towers work? What happens when a lightning protection system is hit? Why do different pads have different numbers of towers? And what does it take to keep them all working? Well, I'm Chris Gebhardt with NASA Spaceflight, and let's get ready for a truly electrifying journey through the world of rocket lightning protection systems. Let's start with the question we're asked all the time. What are those four towers? Well, they're just towers. That's it. They don't actually provide any protection from lightning themselves. So that's it. End of video. Just kidding, just kidding. Not at all, let me explain. The towers that stand very prominently around rocket pads in Florida and other lightning prone areas are just supporting parts of a launch pad's lightning protection system, like this one for United Launch Alliance or ULA at Slick 41. They're just uh, four very tall towers, about 340 feet total. Uh, the top part, the white part that looks like a candlestick, and that's what we call it as a candlestick, is fiberglass. Uh, it's five feet wide, 107 feet long, and that brings the uh, wires up much above where the rocket will be sitting when it's in there. So it provides a, similar to a Faraday cage. Um, it's a catenary system that we call it, and it surrounds and prevents lightning from making it into the rocket under almost all circumstances, as much as we can mathematically predict. So. How does a lightning protection system actually work? But first, over to my good buddy Jack for something else about safety. Thanks, Chris. Also thanks to our sponsor for this video, Surfshark VPN. Just like these lightning towers are a magnet for, well, lightning, when you browse the internet without a VPN, you are making yourself a lightning rod online. Companies are able to track your every click, and then they can use or sell that information. It's not just companies either. Hackers or other nefarious actors can track your activity and sell or exploit your information. A VPN like Surfshark masks your IP address and encrypts your data. This prevents you from being trackable and keeps you safe online whether you're at home or on public Wi-Fi. Plus, as a bonus, you can travel the world in just a single click by setting your virtual location to wherever you please. This means you can stream shows or use services that aren't available in whatever country you're currently in. Super useful. Save 83% and get an extra three months for free right now by going to the link below and entering the promo code NASA Spaceflight when you sign up. Thanks again to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. We can't do these longer, higher production value videos relying on YouTube ad revenue alone. So thanks once again to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Go check them out today. Thanks, Jack. And getting back to lightning protection systems, our big question now is how do they actually work? Rockets can take hours or sometimes even days to move back to a shelter. So when an afternoon thunderstorm is approaching, they have to stay out and weather the storm, so to speak. Dad joke aside, the rockets need a cone of protection, a Faraday cage. And this is how a lightning protection system works, by creating a cone of protection that specifically takes advantage of something lightning really likes, the simplest, easiest conductive path to the ground. And this is what the catenary wires supported by those beloved towers create. With those wires acting as an easy to strike conductive net above the pad, lightning will almost never bypass them and strike the more difficult path, aka the rocket and the pad systems inside the catenary wire created cone of protection. These systems are highly effective. Take the ones at NASA's Pad 39B and ULA's Slick 41. According to Jose Perez Morales, the senior project manager of Exploration Ground Systems, during an interview for this video, a tremendous amount of lightning strikes have occurred at Pad 39B since the three new lightning protection system towers were erected, but none of those strikes, absolutely none of them, have hit inside the cone of protection. You know, we want to stop as many chances as we can um, because we, we rate lightning in uh, similar to like you do floods. You've got the 10 year flood, the 100 year flood, the 1000 year flood. But we even have lightning, you can do the calculations out to the 10,000 year lightning strike, the very 
perfect lightning strike that you can't stop. Jose picked up on this, commenting on the 10,000 year simulation and noting that what NASA found in their modeling is that the probability of a lightning strike hitting the vehicle instead of the catenary system is less than 1%. And a less than 1% chance over 10,000 years of a lightning strike not going where you want it to is a really good lightning protection system. But let's not forget, the system is designed to be hit by strikes, not prevent them. And then all of that energy from the strike needs to be taken safely away from the rocket and the ground systems. So how does that all work? In short, lightning hits the catenary wires. Those big white candlesticks on the towers, those aren't lightning rods. They're not conductive and they don't attract strikes. However, they do have a little rod on top of them that's part of the overall catenary system. They're fiberglass, they're non-conductive. You can see the wire spiraling around in it. Uh, if you look closely at them, but they're actually fiberglass. They're not, they're not insulated. They're not, the lightning doesn't, isn't channeled down the tower. It's channeled out away from the pad. So when the masts appear to be hit, it's actually just lightning hitting the catenary wires or a rod that is on top of those masts that completes the overall protection system and allows the energy of a strike to spread out through the wires and then to the various down conductors. The plan, the whole point is for it to not come down the tower because now you're coming down by oxygen lines, fuel lines, hydrogen over here. Your whole point is to keep it up and away. That's still too close to the rocket than we like. Now, the towers themselves are still grounded just in case they are hit. But as they are inside of the cone of protection created by the catenary wires, they are generally protected from direct strikes. Instead, lightning strikes the catenary wires, and the energy of the strike is then channeled through the wires and down to the ground via down conductors to safely dissipate the energy. And the number of down conductors needed is largely based on the amount of energy the system needs to be able to handle effectively. Over at NASA's Pad B, Jose Morales related that that system actually has nine down conductors, and each one of those down conductors actually has a device at the end that will measure the total energy of a lightning strike. And understanding the total energy of a strike is really important, as are the number of down conductors themselves and their interface with the ground, because if those aren't correct, issues can arise. Take an issue ULA encountered when they took over Slick 41 and its already built lightning protection system from the Air Force and the Titan program. We weren't spreading the voltage of the current out enough when it got to the ground. So much energy was getting there over so long a period of time because we're wide open that they were turning to glass. They were, it was crystallizing the sand. But once it turns into glass and becomes a solid crystalline structure, it's now an insulator. So now you don't have the protection that you thought you had. So getting the size of the entire system right is really important, as is just having it in place. But equally important to the overall ability of the system are inspections, both routine ones and the ones that take place after a strike. When a strike occurs, companies need to make sure that the wires weren't damaged to the point of compromising the cone of protection. Once we have those strikes, we do check it. And if the wire becomes compromised, we do have to replace it. Plus, again, it's Florida, we're right here on the coast, things rot. I mean, metal just breaks down. So we do have to replace them every 20 years at, at least, and then if there's anything more. And this upkeep is important because you never know when the big strike will hit. Just ask NASA and the SLS program as they were preparing for wet dress rehearsal in April 2022. As related by Jose Morales, that strike was the one in a million strike, the biggest lightning strike ever measured at the towers at pad 39B. Yet regular maintenance and upkeep and ensuring the catenary wires were undamaged after previous strikes resulted in a fully functioning system, one that protected SLS exactly as it was supposed to. But just how are those wires inspected since they're really high up off the ground? Well, the answer is drones. Unmanned aerial vehicles provide an easy way to assess the condition of the system. And if damage is detected, crews can then be sent up to perform repairs or further inspections. In fact, that's one of the prime reasons the lightning towers have stairs that go all the way to the top. And those three towers over at 39B that are 600 feet off the ground, they even have single person elevators. But there are still a couple of burning questions. Why are there a different number of towers at different pads? And why are there seemingly no lightning protection systems at all at Vandenberg in California? 
Well, it's not just that ULA prefers four towers while NASA likes three. There are all different ways to ensure isolation from ground. In fact, the four towers seen at Slick 40 and Slick 41 were designed for the Titan program to create a protection area that would allow work at the pad to continue even during a thunderstorm, something that is no longer allowed for worker safety. Meanwhile, Pad 37B with the Delta IV has two towers that actually become three when the mobile service tower is rolled back for launch. That's because there's a little reel up at the top that strings part of the catenary system when it rolls back for launch, creating a third tower to complete the needed area of protection. And of course, 39A just has a single tower. And yes, even Vandenberg has them. So with all that in mind, do the number of towers really matter? And the answer is yes, but it's mostly about the size of the area you want to protect and how the rocket flies off the pad. So the number of towers to protect a specific area for a specific rocket changes from pad to pad. And in fact, the new LC-39B system was originally planned to have four towers as well. So why did that change? Well, remember that 1% chance over 10,000 years of a really bad lightning strike hitting the vehicle and not the protection system? Turns out you can achieve exactly that same level of protection with three towers instead of four. So there you have it, folks, the detailed answer to that famous question, what are those four towers? And if you're like me and you want to continue sharing your love about lightning protection or just want to explain to people what those four towers are, you can definitely check out our merch store and see our new theme for lightning protection. So head on over to shop.nasaspaceflight.com and get your own lightning protection system merch. Until next time, I'm Chris Gebhardt. Later, nerds.